My father's name was Charles Curry and my mother was Maureena and they both came from Frisrub, came to Australia. Well, my father had been here earlier. He went home to Lebanon, married my mother and, and brought her back in 1920. Dad came in 47, just after the war, and we followed. He came to find a place for us over here, and we came a year later in 48. Uh, in those days, I think it was about a six week uh, trip, and the Aronce was the name of the ship, and it was the last passenger liner to come through the Suez Canal before the Second World War. Our grandparents, George Abraham Yarrett, he came first and then Grandma came. She was a Jamili Trad. My father and his two brothers were orphans and they were doing it very tough in Lebanon. And uh, somebody told my, my grandfather, Michael Stephen, about his nephews, so he organised for them to come to Australia. When they came to Australia, they came as one big family group. And I think they came by ship to Melbourne and around up to up to Queensland. And they, they went up to Glen Innes because my dad had an uncle there. His mother's brother was already living there. It was at a time when there was economic reasons for movement because there were big families and the amount of return that you could get off the various properties that were owned by people meant that some parts of the family had to migrate to, to maintain lifestyles. Lebanon, there wasn't too much future over there. It was war-torn, and uh, they thought there was a better future, more chance of a success over here in Australia. Jamil uh, met the boat in uh, Sydney and took, took us as a family to Gundawindi so that mum and dad could learn to speak some of the English language, having no English language knowledge, and also, uh, I think Dad had three pounds in his pocket. As a, a new person came, whoever was here before would help them, you know, to help them with accommodation and to get settled and to get established. And then as things improved, you brought somebody else out. Before they came, all the resources were divided, were somehow they pooled as much financial resources as they could and each of the family members got what we understood was about 200 pounds. Whether they wanted to sell fruit and veggies or whether they wanted to sell drapery, there was Lebanese people in Toowoomba who used to give them a start. In those days, they would give five shillings or 10 shillings as a, a gift for the baby. Dad accumulated 23 pounds from my, off my behalf. And with that, he went and bought a horse and cart a, bull, a bit of fruit to start selling fruit. And the first day, he only sold one cucumber. Most people would have shot the horse and burnt the cart, but he persevered. And of course, with perseverance, he succeeded. Michael would say, well, if you're, you're going to sell fruit, you go west. And the next one he'd help, he'd say, you go east. Or he'd give them directions on where to go so that they weren't trying to sell to the same people. And they always maintained that same area. What they mostly did was travelled around in a horse and cart to go out of the country. And they would stop at farmhouses, you know, and, and little towns. I think it was one of the few things that he could communicate with other people in like if he was selling things he could probably show what he was selling and people could see by his uh, by his intentions what it, it didn't it didn't require an education to do it in the later years uh, the uh, some of the people bought trucks and fitted them up they were huge trucks like a, they were a shop on wheels they became especially the ones from Toowoomba well it was what they knew best of. They weren't into fabrics and that. A lot of the Lebanese went into clothing and that, that but that wasn't my father, father's forte. His was fruit and vegetables. In the country towns, you have everything, you know, Manchester, boots and shoes, toiletries and clothing. He built up a, a wonderful uh, association with his uh, customers. 
and I know it because I used to go out as a young boy, 10 or 11, and, and with him, and I'd sleep on the front seat, he would sleep inside the truck. I would get threepence a gate to open the gates. He lived in the back of the truck and he'd camp, he'd go out and he'd camp over night time on people's properties and he'd sleep in that van and he'd eat with uh, the farmers wherever he'd camped over. But I don't suppose there was much fun in it for anyone. It was just work and, you know, battle through and get done what you had to do and get back home for a short time and then off you go again. So a lot of people were very kind to them, you know. They'd say, you know, they, you stay, you want to sleep out in your truck and you come and eat with us, you know. People were very kind to them, you know, like that, very considerate. There's a lot of very much virgin country out there. These were very isolated groups of people and the opportunity to buy clothes was very, very rare for them. So he was very welcomed and uh, made a lot of good friends out there. When you call on people, you know, say two and three times a year, you became the conduit to some degree for you know, keeping families together. It engendered a lot of love. You know, and he saw kids growing up, you know, from when they were little bubs to, to adults, and it's really quite something to be integrated into their families to the degree that he was. Dad wanted something for the family to do. He, I don't think he was keen on us to go and work outside. Uh, he thought, well, he'll keep us really, really busy. So uh, John and myself started the business. And then as each of the children left uh, of the family, siblings left the uh, school, they came in and every whole 10 of us all worked in the business. As my sisters got older and they were ready to leave school, Dad thought it would be a good idea if he started a business where our, my older sisters could be employed because uh, employment then wasn't, uh, it was hard to find. The eldest ones always worked with the family. That gave the younger ones a chance to go continue their education and then they were, they were able to go away to boarding school and then to go to, to university and to, do, uh, to follow some profession or trade. My wife Pat and myself bought a business and we run uh, a business in two different uh, shops for 34 years and nine months, non-stop, seven days a week. It was sort of like a concept amongst the Lebanese, wherever there wasn't another Lebanese, they would come and set up a business. Mm. And like you found that the Italians went into uh, uh, fruit shops and the Greeks had the cafes, and most of the Lebanese in those days went into uh, uh, clothing. Well, we had everything really, didn't we? we yeah. The whole thing. We had Kubra hats. Yeah, yeah Kubra hats. Yeah. We had the lot. So it was truly a, a, you know, a mix, a general store as such. And they were bargain hunters, like we used to sell John Lyon. Se se singlets for 10 cents and they'd have little, little holes in them. But it was, it was good because the Gabba was just a middle to lower socioeconomic, so people appreciated the fact that we always had these really good specials. Mum was a, ahead of her time um, as far as having women in business and the position that she was in, and she often said how it didn't take long for the men to respect her because she would do some really good buying, um, especially the job lines of, of things, and she'd buy hundreds of them. And um, it was a thing where she was always very good at maths Mum was the backbone because she could read and write, but Dad, even though he couldn't read or write, he could go to the market and buy the fruit and he could knew how to work out money and count. And if he bought a, a box of oranges that had 80 in it, he knew how much he had to sell each one to make a profit. And he could do all that in his head, never put pen to paper. They had some young fellows, I don't know, teenage, probably school kids after school, working for them at the back there, bottling the caro and metho and stuff. And they were mucking around one day and must have, they were flicking matches or something, something to that extent anyway. And, and of course, one of them went into the, the 44 gallon drum of uh, kerosene or something. And the, pla the whole, the fire started, you know, the, the boys ran away and off it. And then the whole building burnt down, burnt to the ground. So they went to the bank manager 
and he said that they were such good businessmen and they'd run such a good store that he had no trouble loaning him the money to build a new store yeah. in the town, yeah. which is what they did. I recall seeing one of their day books from Pittsworth Fruit Shop <clears throat> and their sales for the day would be £1.14 and sevenpence, or £2.06 and eightpence. And that's what they do all, all day, they'd work to get that much. I still put it down, the success of the business was because of my dad's connection with the country people. And when the country people came to town, uh, they would naturally come and do their shopping for clothing at our store. It was their determination through doing that. I think that's, that's why it was such a success, yeah. Because uh, they were able to put eight children through schooling and whatever and supply for them as well, you know, provide a business and it all, it all started with their hard work at the beginning. In the latter part of Dad's life, when he wasn't enjoying the best of health, he would still go down to the shop and sit on a chair with his walking stick and, and his, his day would be made when his old customers would see him there, come up to him and talk to him. People who are illiterate or innumerate, mm. um, they were the sort of people who would come to that business yes. because they would trust the... And you establish a reputation like that and in a small community mm. that becomes your bread and butter in a sense. brought to that town yeah. was that they could be a business that was part of the community and they successfully did that yeah. and and that made us part of the whole town as well us as kids we yeah we sort of fitted into the town because of that relationship we didn't want our family to have to work like we had to work because they can do much better with their education and work less hours than we had to work when we were working you know, yeah, gave us the best of everything. Yeah. I mean, we we went to dancing school, ballet, you know, speech, speech lessons, drama. music, music lessons. We all had instruments. We all played instruments. We all, yeah. You know, it was sort of um, we education were, was such a big deal to Mum because she didn't have one, and mm -hmm. she was adamant. We used to be belted to read books. Patrick, you couldn't stop reading. Us girls were us having fun mostly, but Mum really tried to encourage. She thought reading was so important. I think you know we we reaped the benefits of it. Yeah, we realised just how hard they did work. Yeah, and um, I, I, for me personally, I I don't know whether I could have done it. <laughs> he, he saw Paul leaving with carrying a bag, and and he, he looked at his watch and he said, "Oh, it's three o'clock. Where's Paul going?" I said, "Paul's going to the gym, Dad." The gym? What for? I said, "Football training." He started getting, getting upset. He said, I don't know, we might as well give the business away if they're going to go and play football. <laughs> so he, he, he'd get all a bit upset about that because thinking that the next generation weren't interested. We didn't have the opportunity to go on to secondary education. But we, we were taught how to work and that stuck with us throughout our lives. One of the most important things, we've earned money, good money, and she said, we've done that so you don't have to go to work and that you can spend time just being with your children. And she was very strong on that. Very that strong. We weren't time working with your children, mothers. Mm -hmm. That we weren't working mothers. Because in her day, none of our friends' parents worked, but she worked. Some of the grandchildren are in the business now and others have taken other professions. And um, uh, I think they'd either want you to be a doctor or a yeah, lawyer exactly. Or, exactly. Or, or some sort of profession. So they, they never saw us as staying in the retail game. That was their transition mm. into Australia. They saw their children as moving on to other things. They had this idea that they were coming and they were staying. And so mm. they, had to, they had to make the best of what whatever they came, came across. They, they know they want to make a living, they want to make a success. They know they've got to, they've got to live from the business, but they've got to uh, do things in a, 
an, an honest and proper way. You still get a hankering for those days, seriously, even after all this time. You still think back and wouldn't it be wonderful being something like that still. My wonderful parents. I've got to thank God for the parents I had because uh, they weren't born with silver spoons in their mouth, but they had hearts of gold. But she hate pay full price or anything. Oh, that was upset. That's Lebanese. Yeah, that's Lebanese. I agree. And th those type of values that I think that they put into us realise just how, fa how valuable family ties are. Yeah, so I think my children do have that as a result of spending time with my parents. We followed that on from 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 Dad. We've learned from him, and. Uh, and then hopefully my nieces and nephews have learned from my brothers and myself. And I think that is the characteristic of the Lebanese. They are workers. Uh, they'll tackle anything, they'll stick to it till they complete it, and they don't give in. So that, that is what's seen them through, seen them respected for who they are, and got them to, the, the, to where they are.